and good evening and welcome to the Rodney Allen Rippey Show. I'm your host, Rodney Allen Rippey. And tonight we have a very, very special guest. She is an amazing photographer. She is also in the world of filmmaking. There are so many things about my wonderful guest tonight, but I won't spoil it. We're going to get right into it. Tonight, I'd like to welcome to the Rodney Allen Rippey Show, the one and only Miss Anna Wilding. How are you, Anna? Woohoo, Rodney Allen Rippey. It's an honor, Rodney. <laughs> it's, good, it's good to have you on. Thank you very much, Rodney. It's great to be here. You're a, you're a light in life and a, a legend. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Well, Anna, you know, being involved in the entertainment industry for the years that I've been in, it's always great meeting people, but it's always a ongoing and evolving kind of thing. And with you, you started your world out in photography, but you started sliding into the world of film. Would you mind sharing with my listeners a little bit about Anna Wilding? Uh I will. <laughs> I'm I know it's a lot. I know it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, I did. I kind of started in film and acting, actually. Mm. And then I realized with, no, with still photography, you're absolutely right, with still photography and acting. And I realized mm. with still photography that I was, the, the still image was fantastic, but I really wanted to work with the moving image as well. And so that kind of led me into working more with film where I worked as a producer and director and writer. I worked with some major production companies, uh, oh, wow. vice president. I was in charge of like 13 million rotating funds one year. Um, mm. uh, you know, I set up my own company in London when I was there. I was running companies in Hollywood in the mm. heyday of the independent films with all the studios and stuff. And I was art directing before that and production designing. So I've had a long and lengthy and, and deep career. Uh, I get asked to consult a lot still on films because of that. Uh, I've actually worked on films hands-on around the world. So whether it's been Isle of Man or Africa, uh, so I have an in-depth experience. But at the heart of everything is I'm known as a creative. And I haven't really picked up the camera. I hadn't for a long, long time mm -hmm. until I was compelled to do so for the Obamas. I used to have a photographic studio when I was a teenager. I'd photographed everyone who there was to photograph in New Zealand at the time. Um, and I hadn't, and I'd been published in magazines then, and it wasn't until I was in D.C. and I was really compelled to photograph the Obamas. I couldn't stand the racism that was being levied at them. And also I knew I could make a difference through my photography work compared with how the, the normal day-to-day uh, -day news photographers uh, sometimes were careless in their... Uh, perception or the way they captured the Obamas, which was not lending itself to helping uh, the racism that was out there, basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, being, you know, born here in Southern California, you know, things seem to move a little bit faster and, and people seem to be a little more open to things. But having also lived on the East Coast and, and having experienced um, not so kind people, shall I say, and you kind of, you, you wonder how, do, how does something like that continue on and on and on. But, you know, I remember uh, speaking with my father and um, when President Obama was elected, I said, Dad, what do you think about that? And, you know, my dad is, you know, 80, you know, he's in his upper 80s now. And, and, and he said, I never thought I would see it in my lifetime. And that really impacted me to hear my father say something like that. And I was thinking like, wow. So, you know, it was just a, a, a great opportunity for our nation. It actually helped move things forward. And, I, and I'm thinking that now is the time as we, through your wonderful art and through people like you who are just wanting to see more beautiful things out there, you know, in your, your incredible uh, 
I had the pleasure actually of experiencing your wonderful uh, art gallery there and in, in, in the down in uh, it was that that was down in um, Palos Verdes. Yeah, you, you you came to the exhibit, one of the month long right. exhibits. I think celebrate we had four hope. of them. Celebrate Pardon? hope. Celebrate yeah. hope. Yes, you came to the, one of the opening nights, and we had packed houses. I mean, the walkthroughs. Usually, you expect about fifty people to turn up to a walkthrough, and mm -hmm. galleries were like, "Oh my God, two hundred people have shown up." You know, we're packed and things like that. So, celebrate hope came at a very interesting time. We launched at. Uh, 2019 Black History Month, yep. and it played uh, three solo exhibits before it had a group show at the Leica, uh, and uh, we played all the way up to the midterms, and uh, Palos Verdes is a very conservative area, as you know, and mm -hmm. I had staunch Republican woman and man coming and crying and laughing when they saw the exhibit, laughing because of the joy that they saw behind the walls of the White House at, at that time during the Obama presidency, and also crying and lamenting that the White House had become, under that current administration, something that was not uh, relatable for a, a lot of people. Um, and also, Rodney, I just wanted to say, I mean, a shout out to you. I mean, it's really interesting speaking to you and specifically you came through after Martin Luther King mm -hmm. and you were the biggest black child star on television. Oh, wow. um, and so you yourself carried a very strong message at that time and a message of hope um, for people back in the 1970s, was it? Yes, thank you. That's when it all got started, 1970s. Yeah, yeah when it all got started. So you're a, a big part of this uh movement this to to bring a better wow. outcome for everyone in this world you know well, I'm, um, I'm, no matter very of their background. I'm very honored that you that you would say that it, and i have to say you know starting out in entertainment at the age of three and a half i was just a little guy little kid on the west side of long beach and middle class family and my dad was a blue collar worker i mean worked for the city of Long Beach, and he was just a normal, everyday guy, and we were a normal, everyday family, and my mom just saw something in me, not only me, my brother, Kenneth Wayne, and my sister, Beverly Lee, she thought there was something special about all of us, and so she kind of got this funny little scheme to to see if she could get us all, a, you know, an agent, and, and just see what happens, and lo and behold, you know, uh, I landed the the Jack in the Box commercial, and that's where my career started. And I mean, I've worked with legends from mm -hmm. Sammy Davis Jr. to George Burns to Louis Gossett Jr. and Mel Brooks, and boy, I, I mean, Johnny Carson. I can go on and on and on. And I was very uh, fortunate to have had that opportunity. And my mom told me at a very young age. She said, Rodney. A lot of people are counting on you, and I and I, you know, I was just a little kid. Come on, yeah, three, really four, understand. you know, growing growing through this thing. But my mom always, you know, instilled in me that this is serious business. And and my mom, I, I remember being on a set one day, and my mom said, "Rodney, remember how your dad goes to work in the morning so early?" And I'm like, "Yeah, he leaves like six o'clock in the morning." She's like, "Well, you have a job." And she said, you're just like your father. You have a job to do. And I was like, I'm, like, <laughs> I'm so little. And my mom's like, doesn't matter, son. You got a job to do. But but the thing was, she always said, don't worry about nothing else happening on the set. And don't worry about the lights. And don't worry about the camera. She said, just do your job. And I was just like, got it, mom. And that's what happened, you know. And so, but. You know, Anna, I'm, I'm so excited. And I, I thank you for giving me the honor to have you on. I mean, having the first ever uh, uh, NTF of uh, NFT, I'm sorry. NFT. NFT, <laughs> NFT. NFT of the Obamas. And, you know, having this collection is like amazing. I mean, it, it's world, world known. We're hoping that this thing takes off like wildfire. And I mean, I have, I mean, I just had you know, a few notes. I mean, from that, you have your new Mesmerize. That's the, the new hot thing that's happened. Tell me about Mesmerize. Yeah, so Celebrate Hope. I had uh, exhibits uh, scheduled, uh, a few throughout mm -hmm. America, 
-hmm. and a couple in Europe and Italy. I had a beautiful exhibit scheduled in Venice. And of course, everything, the pandemic hit and everything was over. Last year, I consulted on a few movies and that was about it. Every single gallery show I had was cancelled because Mm -hmm. the museums and galleries were closed, of course. Fast forward to this year and I hear about these these digital art and this movement called non-fungible tokens. And I'm fascinated because technically uh, I've always uh, made sure to keep abreast of things technically. So, for example, over 25 years ago, I was working pre-Oculus, the virtual reality right now, I was working with part of the team that worked and brought Jaron Linear down Uh, the Mm -hmm. patent holder of virtual reality. And we worked with Stanley Jordan. We flew him out from New York. And we did the first ever music video utilizing virtual reality so that hospitals and other organizations could understand, including television and Mm -hmm. film studios, could understand how this technology could be adapted. And I'm very excited about NFTs because in a way I see it as an evolution. And a artistic evolution so it builds on my show celebrate hope for a start Mm -hmm. and it allows me to get things into the marketplace in a different way i think there's definitely a new generation coming through Mm -hmm. they've grown up on computers their values and what they see art to be i think we can already tell by this strong showing in the nft community is a little bit different from how we would consider um the value of art and what we consider sort of valuable art pieces. This generation wants art that's portable. Yeah. They obviously love color. Uh, they love animation. And even though we were playing around with a lot of this stuff 25 years ago, to be honest, this mm-hmm. is not technically from a visual standpoint uh, that new that the, because we were developing and pioneering a lot of this work when we were doing music videos whether it was rolling stones or ub40 or whoever it was but now these up-and-coming artists for them it's new and they found a way to put it on the blockchain the 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 crypto blockchain Mm -hmm. so that's very exciting for them that they can copy so if i so it's tied into cryptocurrency is that correct I, it is, but it won't always be. So, for example, the early platforms, you could only buy the art using cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. but there are new platforms setting up where you can use your credit card to buy the art. Wow. And what's fantastic is I can literally, uh, a collector can come along and say, buy one of my pieces, digital pieces that I've 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 adapted from my show, mm-hmm. and they can have it in London within 24 hours. I mean, immediately after purchase, they can have the JPEG. It may not be a signed version, but it's been signed on the blockchain. Mm-hmm. And that's a digital signature that could it is a, a counterpoint to a, a hand signature. Mm-hmm. Uh, my generation is going to appreciate the print on the wall and, and my hand signature <laughs> without mm-hmm. question. But I think a lot of this young generation or new gallerists are really considering that that uh, blockchain signature equivalent to the signature, you know, by hand. Mm-hmm. So that's very exciting because to move a piece of art, say from Los Angeles to London, who, mm-hmm. who I've had collectors who are interested, and I've definitely been collected on the East Coast, New York, and all through the through the east coast it's expensive i'm having to send mats rather than frames because to send a frame picture costs a thousand two thousand dollars to send yeah. so uh it's, it's it opens up a world for artists mm-hmm. there's not to say there's not going to be a lot of pitfalls and experimentation for people there are and there's a lot of regulations that have yet to come into play and stuff but mm-hmm. very very exciting and a very unique way to to work with uh for me with photographs and because i come from a background of music videos and film of course i'm used to playing around with technology Ooh. and using that as much as I can to get uh, something really interesting in film and music videos. So now I'm just bringing that into the still image, bringing that years. I mean, I would say in reality, these pieces took about 20 pieces, 25 pieces, 25 years to come to market, you know, Mm -hmm. because it comes with sort of the wisdom and experience of a creative career. And so your art, you bring it alive with with some really great music. Tell me, you're doing almost like a 
a, a fusion and a mix between the colors, the, the movement, and as well as sound? Yeah, so on some of the color stuff, I uh, collaborated with another digital artist called Clarence, who's based in Europe. Uh, he has, I really love the way he works with color. He has a similar color approach that I did. So we, I worked with him. And what was key to me, of course, coming from a music video background was, of course, having music. So I sought out a couple of different artists who I could get asked to create some original music. Okay. And one is a British, uh, she was number 20 on the British charts, and she's American from New right. York. Uh, XO Anne and Tello with an incredible voice because I loved uh, and seeing Andre Day and photographing Andre Day who sang that song Rise Up at the White House. It was an incredible moment. Yeah. And I was really looking for a powerhouse soulful voice. And I found that in Anne Tello because, of course, Andre Day wasn't available at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think she was busy wow. tied up with her Oscar campaign this year. And the other artist I discovered, he was actually in a short film, which I don't usually watch short films, but he opened the film with a two-minute spoken rap, spoken word piece. And this was before Andrea Gorman got up, actually, who was a, who's incredible and amazing, a Amanda Gorman. Um, but it was so strong and so powerful, and I just knew then I had to work with uh, Saran. And his uh, stage name is S Rap and Saran Thompson, and he's based in Nashville, and he's an incredible wow. up-and-coming spoken word rap artist. And what I love about S-Rap is he's incredibly smart, so it's not just sort of like thug rap. I mean, right. he really has something to say, and he was very inspired by the photographs, and he really was able to speak to what it's like to be a black man growing up with Obama as a president, and really his first president that he's fully conscious about because he's, yeah. he's still young, you know? Mm -hmm. Very, it's very positive, you know, and the whole thing is we're, we want our nation to be, you know, inspired. They, they want, you know, we want them to be so, you know, fired up about, you know, what's happening right now. And that's what it's all about. And I mean, you are like the, the new, you know, say 2021, you know, female Andy Warhol with your beautiful, I'm hoping oh, that your, your work is, is as rare and well collected, you know, as Andy's. But, you know, when you're looking at your pieces, it's, it's really great to see that people can uh, have a piece of your credential art and see some of the image and some of the hard work that went into your work there at the White House during the Obama administration and, and seeing you know, and me seeing some of your art firsthand, I was blown away. I mean, it literally, you know, takes you there and you're like, wow, you really felt, you know, just Thank walking you. through the gallery and looking at all of the various shots. I mean, when it comes down to the money shot, you got some serious pictures of uh, just not only the Obamas, but just the whole overall atmosphere at that time. Yeah, I, th I think that's what's, uh, you know, what I do as an artist is, with my photographs is um, sort of strip that that wall down that we all sometimes have professionally and really get into the heart of the moment um, and the dignity of the moment when it comes to the Obamas. I'm not just shooting like a news photographer, just not even looking through the lens and going blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm really focusing and, and getting that one shot that really brings us into that world. Um, <laughs> I, you know, if I was the president, I would have to tell every news organization, do not take a picture of me if I'm in the middle of a sentence. Because I'm like, why are they taking pictures of them? They, they're so unbecoming. And some of these pictures are like, it almost seems in intentional. But your pictures, all of them were just great. Thank you Even, very much. And, and I really love the point. shot with the, the Denver Broncos. That was amazing. That shot with the team. Come on, you know. All the Denver Broncos fans would go crazy to have that in there. Yeah, so I'm putting that up. That's uh, a very special. It, it's three out of five. We sold several at the art gallery shows. Wow. Um, when an invitation wasn't a question. And so, of course, there was a time during the last administration after Obama where people were really questioning whether they wanted to go to the White House when they received an invitation, especially every all the players on the sports team so mm -hmm. that's why I called it when an invitation wasn't a question you know I'm very diligent the way I work I mean it's hard work uh, the White House isn't glamorous it's hard work you're there every day um, mm -hmm. 
that the president's in town uh, and it, it can be a lot of sitting around and waiting. And you, you spoke to sometimes it looks like the news photographers are intentionally getting uh, politicians when their mouths are open and things like that. And I, whether it's intentional or just a lack of care, I mean, the news photographer is shooting the event as a whole. It's not really looking for the moments that I'm looking for. Right. It's not looking for that intimacy that, that I'm going for. So, and I, I thank you so much for being touched by the exhibit. Um, yeah. it, it, it was a powerful, um, from what I understand, exhibit for people to, uh, to visit. I mean, and, you know, having your experience and, and being a professional in the world of photography and also in film and things like that, what would you say to a young person who um, might want to enter into that world? Would you advise and what tips would you give them if you said, hey, if you want to go all the way, if you could give one tip to someone, a young person who's looking at photography, what would it be? It would be if you are really compelled uh, to take up the camera and know your reasons mm -hmm. and think you can serve humanity and do it for a reason greater than yourself, then I would say go for it. So for me, photography was never about me. It was mm -hmm. uh, being of service to humanity, telling a story of the greater good, um, being impactful, m making changes, making positive differences. Um, Fashion photography is, is never for me, even though I've done a bit of modeling and have been photographed in, in that way. And of course, as an actress, from a creative standpoint, point from me as creator behind the scenes, mm -hmm. I'm looking to make an, an impact and a, and a difference. And so even at an early age, when I first picked up the camera, I was already studying tribes in the Amazon and in Africa all the way where I grew up in the South Island of New Zealand, because I was fascinated between the interplay of women in those tribes and men. And I had sort of put together a whole portfolio of ideas and works about an, a, a film I wanted to make and a photography series I wanted to do on that. So I was inspired also by a photographer for uh, called Henry Cartier Brison, who was known for his street photography and things as well. So you know, as a photographer, you go through a lot of life cycles, I think, and you find, um, like, I love landscape photographers, and there's some stunning, stunning landscape photographers, but that's not my modus operandi. I'm, I'm looking to make a difference uh, that, that touches the human spirit uh, and brings us in touch with that human spirit. So I would tell any youngster to be very clear of what you're doing and why you're doing it, mm -hmm. and if you are blessed with the eye, you can't really teach the eye of photography. I don't think you can teach design and tech and all of this other stuff that may go, mm -hmm. you can layer it with. But I think um, I'm known for quite a low shooting ratio. I don't need to shoot a lot to get a shot. I can get it. I pretty much know what I want to shoot and how to frame it uh, straight away. Um, and I think if a kid feels like he has those abilities, you know, absolutely explore it. It is a profession. You can make money out of it. Mm -hmm. And I would urge any parent listening to, if their kid is really interested in that, there are some fantastic photography schools around sure. um, and universities. And it's, it's definitely a great, great career, whether you're doing it from the fashion side or the photojournalism side or, you know, whatever aspect you take, wildlife, wh whatever aspect you take, there's a whole range of things you can do with it. Okay. Now I got a heavy question for you. Now you're in the world of photography. All right. Tell me, what is your opinion, film or digital? What do you like most? Oh my gosh. So you see, I grew up old school, both as a director, film d director and filmmaker Mm -hmm. And as a photographer, I grew up with that, you know, working in editing suites, winding the editing spool around, cutting yeah. and splicing and, and movie film. And the same, I was printing in the dark room, black and white. And I am so thankful for my experience in those areas. I, I love film. I love working with digital. I love its speed. I love the fact we can get work out really, really quickly. Crank it. Yeah. But yeah. I, I love the feel and, and the look and of film. And I think with film, you have to be so much more thoughtful about what you're doing. You know, right. they used to sell, you know, you get 36 pictures, right? And, and Boy, so you, you have to make them good. 
you had to make you had to make them good, right? So I see that you know I was on a Levi's commercial once. I, it was a big steel mm-hmm. one, and I was a, a, just associate producer on it. But they were paying this guy like fifty grand a day or something ridiculous. He did not look through the lens once. I mean, he was just snap, snap, snapping because some people, you know, you can get away with that. He had his editor back in the truck and they would just pull the images that worked. And I remember saying to the marketing director of Levi's, I said, you know what, um, you know, this is a $3 million shoot. I can deliver this with my friend for like 200000 250000 This is right. ridiculous because in all honesty, the shots were not that good at all, right? And... Mm-hmm. They'd rented this big house in Malibu and he was just blithely not even looking through the lens. And um, she, you know what she said to me? She said, oh, don't you get it? Like I was some, so she said, it's not, a, it's not about that. It's about that we're being seen to shoot the biggest budget Levi's commercial ever. And that is where our publicity is. That's why we're getting the marketing and publicity dollar out of that fact that we're spending $3 million. So they did not actually care what the shots look like at all. It was literally so that all the advertising agencies and all the ad magazines and all the newspapers would say, hey, Levi's just spent $3 million on a still photo shoot. Wow. So there's, that was, I, I don't know why I just suddenly talked about that. I think I talked about it because there's still sexism, pervasive sexism in, in the industry. It, it's just sure. a fact. Um, there's very, I, I don't do fashion, so I'm not in that, that, that world of 50,000 a, a shoot. Mm-hmm. But the ratio of men to woman in any of these worlds, there are a lot of women now, but I think equality, sponsorship, like Nikon I don't think has sponsored a woman yet. Like they sponsored Canon in their art gallery exhibits and things, but Nikon mm-hmm. hasn't. There's still a, a lot of uh, issues issues there. So the same in film. I, I'm, I've unfortunately chosen two professions that have had major equality pay issues throughout oh. Yeah, but I, I mean, but as you see, I mean, women are winning major awards for their film work and documentaries and and you, I mean, doing, like I said, just what you're doing here with mm-hmm. your one of a kind NFTs and, and you know, it's going to be um, exciting. I mean, these times as, as America starts to reopen and the world starts to reopen uh, post the pandemic, people are excited. There's a new energy and I believe there's a new awareness and people are leveling the playing field and we want to see more women, more diversity and more action, more growth across the board as, as technology and as our world moves forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole issue of diversity, repatriation in America, repatri- not repatriation, the reparation of funds back to certain communities in America. I'm hoping that all of these are issues that are going to be discussed uh, at, at the forefront. Well, they're already being discussed, oh, yeah. but I hope real cha- and effective change takes place. And for women, I think everyone says the same a- about women. I mean, I go back to overseas countries and they can't believe that women in the workforce here in America are earning 20% less than men. And they, when they're not overseas, they're earning equals. So America mm. usually leads the charge in all of this, but somehow it's fallen a bit behind, as you know, in all mm. areas. And, you know, the people are strong. The voice of the people are strong and, and they're making it very clear what, which direction people, they want this country to go in. And Please, please share. I mean, I don't, I don't want to get too far away from your, your wonderful exhibit, Mesmerized. Please tell how, when is this going to happen? When can people find out more about your amazing NFT? Oh, sure, Rodney. I was, I was prattling on then. There you go. <laughs> Ready to charge forward, lead a nation, right? <laughs> there you go. Well, hey, listen, this is not our, this is not hopefully going to be our one and only interview. I hope that you'll come back and keep me filled in and keep my viewers out yeah. there filled in on what you're doing, where you're going. And hey, I definitely want my, next invite to your next big gallery and sure, whether it's film or your- gallery so yeah. broadly the, the the show is up this this mesmerized uh mm-hmm. is four or five pieces it goes up for a 48 hour auction on the 2nd of june 2021 which is next wednesday at 10 a.m okay i think that's oh. eastern time 
48 mm -hmm. hours. It's on a site called Maker's Place, M-A-K-E-R-S Place.co, I believe. Uh, I'm unsure as to if people have to set up a digital wallet first. They might, but once they're in the set site, they can uh, bid with their credit card or their bank account. Uh, we've kept the reserves low so that anyone can uh, can participate. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there might be some goodies thrown in along the way and anyone can write to me if, if they want a limited edition print or to discuss anything with me, they can go to annawilding.world, uh, W-I-L-D-I-N-G.world and contact the team there and uh, we can show you what's, what's available. And we hope to have, uh, I've scheduled one exhibit, we hope to have some more exhibits this year and get back on track and, and share good good vibes with people and, and keep spirits happy and uplifted, right? It's That's not political. Right. It's actually not political at all. It's just no. bringing people into the people's house. You saw the exhibit. It's bringing people into the people's house. Which... Yes, yes. And you, and you have the type of pieces that are, you know, people would be proud to have in their home. And, and if you are a collector of beautiful art, you definitely have to go check that out. Anna Wilding. Work, dot world correct and a yes. world dot world um i'm excited you know we're looking forward to it make Thank sure you, you get me. and also don't forget the uh collect uh celebrate hope the obama collection that's your book is that correct they can yeah that's the book based on the exhibit some of the photographs from the exhibit as well so yes and this show is called mesmerize the digital show so yes well, we're excited well everyone Thank you rodney you have just seen the one and only miss anna wilding Get ready for her wonderful NFTs and so much more beautiful art. Thank you so much for what you've Thank given, you so much. given the okay. world. And we look forward to seeing great things come from you. Thank you, Rodney. It's been an honor. Thank you.